today, I'm basically going to be talking about the art world yesterday, so to speak. Um, I thought, I mean, this is a, not really a formal lecture so much as reflections, and I thought that since in recent years there's been so much emphasis on, on theory uh, related to art and art history, and um, this has become, I think, in many ways so problematical, I would like to talk about the necessity to go back to the works themselves um, and the way in which very frequently theory is transformed into a kind of mythology. The most uh, obvious, perhaps, in 20th century art is the way in which certain aspects of Cubist painting, for example, the fact that supposedly that Cubist painting is objective as it was framed in 1911-12, or that Cubist paint painting shows multiple viewpoints. These are all cliches that then become kind of myths and then uh, generations of students have the misfortune of being told that these things are true. They look at the pictures, they don't see it, but they've been told it's true, so they assume that it's there. They become teachers and they tell their students that it's true. And so I'd like to talk about a few things that were myths of Impressionism that most of us probably have grown up with, those of us who are older than 25 uh, in any case. And they are, let's start with the first two slides. I thought we'd use these as a kind of types. Um, these are both Monet's. Most, many of the paintings I'm going to show you today are Monet paintings, taking Monet as the kind of typical Impressionist. Um, and they are that Impressionist paintings are painted spontaneously, often in a single sitting. Impressionist paintings are painted directly from nature. Impressionist painters paint naturally, as Monet at one point said, I paint naturally as a bird sings. That Impressionist painters paint mindlessly. And I say mindlessly, not only in the, you know, in the, in the way that we frequently use the term today, but mindlessly as a kind of prise de position, as a kind of uh, stance. Um, Monet himself, for example, uh, in a famous interview said that he um, wished that he'd been born blind so that he could see everything freshly with innocent eyes. That is, when I say mindlessly, I mean the eye without the mind. Um, and therefore, with motifs chosen almost at random and accepted as they are with little or no modification, which has, in a very peculiar way, uh, in a surprising way, as we'll see in a few minutes, set up a kind of almost photographic paradigm for a lot of Impressionist painting. And we know their paintings, but frequently they're looked at as if they were photographs, sometimes even discussed, in fact, frequently discussed, as if uh, they were photographs when the subject matter is discussed. That Impressionism is a form of realism and avoids any kind of symbolic meaning that Impressionist painting is objective and to some degree scientific, that Impressionist painting is basically almost in, uh, his, in, entirely ahistorical, that Impressionism is a systematic style based on the accumulation of dabs of complementary colors. And you look at these two paintings, you realize how far away from uh, that as a system, uh, what I'm saying uh, is. Um, so that colors are, in effect, mixed in the eye. And that largely, of course, as many of you are aware, is a, is a kind of um, misreading of Impressionism through the eyes of Signac's uh, book on Neo-Impressionism from Eugene Delacroix to Neo-Impressionism. That Impressionism is a consistent style practiced in a fairly consistent way by a number of different painters. And finally, that these artists represented a unified group, that is Manet, Monet, Renoir, and Degas, Cezanne. And of course, as you begin to list people who showed with the Impressionists, you realize how ununified the group was. Now, one of the questions we might ask ourselves is that most, and what I, I would say that most of these, all of these statements are usually untrue. Um, they're not always untrue, but they're usually untrue. And I would like to, what I'd like to talk about tonight are what's, what the sources of some of these myths are and um, what some ways of thinking about them might be. Now, one of the things I wanted to do, maybe at the beginning, before I start talking only about the pictures, um, is to very briefly give you some 
uh, contemporary accounts. This is Emile Blémont, 1876. He says that the, this, is all, this is kind of the documentary, or the documentation now of some of the statements I've been making, who writes that um, to render um, their, their goal, the goal of the Impressionists, was to render with absolute sincerity the impression aroused in them by the appearance of reality without compromise or softening and using free and simple means. Um, Jules Lafourgue in 1883, the Impressionist, he says, is one who, forgetting the pictures amassed through the centuries in museums, this is the historical aspect, forgetting his optical art school training, line, perspective, color, by dint of living and seeing frankly and primitively, now notice the words, sincerely, frankly, primitively, freely, in bright open air, that is, outside his poorly lighted studio, um, whether the city street, the country, or the interiors of houses, the Impressionist painting is one who has succeeded in remaking for himself a natural eye. And then we get back to Monet's uh, idea, as later stated, um, of wanting to see like a child, like someone who's seeing for the first time, and in seeing naturally and painting as simply as he sees. Um, Lafour then goes on to talk about what he calls two artistic illusions, the two criteria on which aestheticians have foolishly insisted absolute beauty and absolute human taste. And he says, instead one can, well, actually I won't go into that because I'll be here reading all night long. But in any case, you get the, the gist of what I'm saying. And what I want to call your attention to, especially, is the vocabulary, this, this notion of sincerity, um, freedom, the primitive. And in fact, um, Dure, in his uh, essay on the Impressionist Painters in 1878, gives us almost a kind of anecdotal framing of how this is affected. The Impressionist sits on the banks of a river, depending on the condition of the sky, the angle of vision, the hour of the day, the calm or agitation of the atmosphere. I'm sorry, I should have said, depending on the uh, condition of the day, the angle of vision, the hour of the day, the calm or agitation of the atmosphere, the water takes on a complete range of tones. Without hesitating, he paints on his canvas water, which has all these tones. Now, what I also find interesting about this is there's a kind of instantaneity assumed here. Without hesitating, he paints water that has all of these tones, almost, again, as if the painter is act acting uh, like a, uh, a camera or as if he has maybe five or six hands so he can do it all at once. The whole sense of the time that it takes to, to fabricate the image, any calculation that may go into the image, is um, under, uh, is played down. Now, one of the questions we might ask ourselves is why? And I think that, and here are images by Monet of his houseboat, and I'm talking, I want to show you now some, a couple of what I might call icons of the painter out in the middle of nature painting spontaneously and freely. Monet's houseboat on the uh, left-hand side and Monet's painting on the right-hand side of Monet's, not, I, did, I said houseboat, I meant studio boat. Um, Monet's painting on the right-hand side of Monet painting in his studio boat uh, on the uh, right at Argenteuil, painted in 1874 with Madame Monet seated uh, uh, between him and the canvas. And the canvas, in fact, is a recognizable canvas. And I'd like to take as my point of departure these two often compared paintings and um, consider what our point of view is and what the sense of time is in these two paintings. Now, if we think of these two paintings as being painted as, uh, as with the statement uh, that I just read you, sort of instantaneously, water. Um, for example, he sees water and then he paints the water in all its tones. And you look at these two paintings, you realize, first of all, that they are painted with very different systems involved. In fact, one very interesting thing is that if you compare the water in these two paintings, not to speak for a moment of the rest of the paintings, if you compare the water, you realize that the Renoir painting on the left-hand side, and these two paintings were painted in 1869, the two artists working uh, not literally, but virtually, and, and side by side, or close to each other. Um, 
if you look at the water and the Renoir painting on the left-hand side, you will notice that he seems to be following his visual sensations with a certain amount of closeness, as opposed to the uh, Monet painting on the right-hand side, on the right-hand side, in which there seems to be some sort of an underlying system to the water, almost as if there was some sort of a, a sort of an elaborate linear pattern that he had noticed in the way in which the water is rippling and he is following um, that pattern. And this can be seen in a very interesting way in something that I don't think will be easy to do tonight. That is if you turn the two slides upside down. Uh, the perspective in the Monet on the right hand side goes zooming back, whereas in the Renoir it remains relatively flat. Um, now the, okay. Is that going to be easy to do? Because if it's not, No, up, just flip them exactly upside down. Oops. You see the, the extraordinary uh, depth of the Monet and how much more, uh, how much more convincing it is? Um, and, and I think there is a kind of underlying perspectival system that he is using here, a linear system, which Renoir is not. Okay, could you go back again now? Now, the other thing about the... Monet and the Renoir paintings is that although one of the things that we might say, well, this is a relatively objective style, or put it this way, if both of these people are just trying to paint what they see, um, wouldn't we get closer versions? And of course, um, I mean, that's a kind of a straw man question because we realize what we are dealing with here are two different conceptions which are based on the very personal and idiomatic way that each of the two artists is seeing the painting. And what is interesting is that both of these paintings are really quite calculated, but they're calcul calculated to rather different ends. For example, uh, the, in the Monet painting, the general composition has a very strong geometrical substructure. Um, can you hear me if I go out like this? Yeah, okay. For example, if you look to where the uh, island is, you'll see that it is literally, by drawing diagonals, right in the geometrical center of the painting. And not only is it in the geometrical center of the painting, but it's in a sense that the ellipse form kind of spins around, and the tree and the reflection of the tree are like an axis around which he spins the composition. And then when you look at the lines that come out, you'll notice that without being too, too close, he literally spins the rest of the composition off the island in the center. In other words, there's a very strong uh, emphasis on the underlying geometrical substructure, which is not simply um, obviously coincidental. It has, it's not simply because he just picked the motif and just laid it any which way on the canvas. The Renoir, on the other hand, is um, arranged, as you can see, in a, quite a different way. Look at the boats, for example, in the foreground, which tends to emphasize or restate um, the, uh, a single planar direction, and it kind of reinforces the general, generally flatter quality of the Renoir painting. But not only that, look at the details in the Renoir painting. In the Renoir painting, what Renoir has done is he has calculated the amount of detail he's going to tell us, which goes beyond, I would uh, suggest, what the eye can really see in an impressionistic or generalized way. That is to say, he has, as it were, zeroed in, as opposed to Monet, um, where the figures are handled in a very general way, it would be relative, I mean, you could get a general idea for, you get a very general idea of how the figures are dressed in the Monet. In the Renoir, I think that if you really knew how to make clothes, you could probably almost reconstruct the clothing that these people are wearing, the, the, the ribbons that hang on the, the back of the neck of the woman in the whitish dress uh, whose back is toward us. Um, the fact that the man who's standing next to her has stripes down the side of his trousers. Uh, there really is an enormous amount of information about the people which Monet has left out. And something else, of course, that's very interesting is that Renoir, unlike Monet, who's, who's looked at the kind of broad overall structure of the, of the scene, Renoir has not only emphasized the, the details of the individual uh, people, but he has also given us this scene very much as a moment in time. And there is a, a, a very obvious clue to that moment in time quality, and that has to do with one of the two dogs. You'll notice that there are two dogs. One of them is sleeping or lying down. The other one, however, has his paw here, and he's about to do one of... I guess three things. He's about to either jump into the boat, back off, or fall into the water. And as we look at this, we realize, of course, that 
that something has to happen in the next moment. And what is so interesting here is that Renoir, in a sense, has given us a code for the fact that there is, this is a moment in time, a single moment in time, and that the, the, the future action is set up. In other words, we, we are anticipating already the future action. The next moment already we are anticipating. And what's so interesting about this to me um, is, of course, the whole notion that a painting like this could have been painted very, very quickly, without calculation, directly from nature, um, Renoir painting, as the texts say, only what he saw. Because, of course, he can't have seen all of these things at the same time and recorded them at the same time. So that what he is doing, in fact, is choosing a typical moment in the duration of this scene, and then he is presenting that moment to us as if, after calculation, as if it were a specific individual moment. Second point I want to make, the second large point that I want to make, uh, has to do with the scenes themselves. For example, on the left-hand side is another version of the same place in, uh, along the Seine, La Grenouillère, by Monet. Uh, slightly smaller canvas, as I remember the canvas. Um, though again, both, as you know from the painting on the right, which is in the Met, we're dealing with relatively small canvases. Um, and, of course, when you look on the left-hand side, you can see exactly where it relates to the scene on the right-hand side. In fact, as the two slides are juxtaposed now, you can, it's almost as if some of those women dressed in those quaint uh, bathing costumes have actually walked off that central island uh, on their way back to the left. But what's so interesting here um, is that Monet, in fact, did a few versions of this, and the one on the right is the almost, until quite recently, was the only one that was published regularly. And what is, and this is true if you go through the Wildenstein catalogue raisonne of Monet's work, for example, and you look at various scenes, including, by the way, the one that I started with on the left-hand side, which I don't have actually, um, I don't have good slides of other scenes, but for many of these motifs, there are in fact several versions, one of which tends to be in the textbooks or not only in the textbook, one of which tends to be constantly reproduced. Now, the reason that I point this out is that one could make a case for the fact that one of the things that Monet, let's say, is doing here is he is, in, in, in current parlance, deprivileging the specificity of certain moments. That is to say, in a certain way, you can say that because Monet goes back to the same motif over and over again, what he is saying is that, and, and in this sense it is a kind of profoundly ahistorical painting, he is saying that in fact one moment in time is not necessarily more important than other moments in time. Theoretically, as many canvases as an artist can set up and paint of a motif or different parts of a motif could have equal validity. Now, this, of course, is not generally true of much historical painting, especially painting that takes religious or uh, historical subject matter, I should say traditional painting, painting that takes uh, religious or historical subject matter, uh, because, of course, there, the whole notion of, of a historical moment is this is a moment that in a sense is lifted out of time and becomes symbolical. This is something that carries across time and is not part of a, a series of equal moments, so that there's a kind of implied leveling of time. What I find so ironical is that, uh, except with the series paintings, such as the Haystacks and the Rouen Cathedral uh, and so forth, that uh, are usually reproduced as series, these other paint, the, the serial nature of these other paintings is usually overlooked, and in a certain sense, uh, going ag to, to a degree against this uh, leveling out process that seemed to be part, an important part, of Monet's uh, enterprise. Now, um, in looking at the last two paintings, we saw to what a strong degree both of those paintings um, are calculated. And if you look at the surface of those paintings carefully, and if you go to the Metropolitan Museum and look at that astonishing painting uh, on the right-hand side, which in passing, by the way, has a, an, an amazing effect, which is that you can actually see the bottom of the, the, the mud on the bottom of the pond. I mean, you almost feel that. I don't know if, you, if you've seen the painting lately, but 
And I mean, it, has, it has some of that quality that he gets at in the later water lilies. I say that just in passing. My main point is that when you look at the painting, you also realize that it wasn't painted in a single sitting because he's painting wet over dry, sometimes with pigments that seem to take a fair amount of time to dry. Um, and this whole notion of uh, the, the studiousness and the calculation of Monet's technique comes uh, from a series of insights that were first, uh, to my knowledge, uh, put forth by Robert Herbert in a very interesting article in Art in America in 1979. Um, and this, in the specialist literature, um, these now, I mean, this investigation of Monet's uh, actual painting method is something that has been pushed really quite far, as in John House's uh, monograph on Monet. And Herbert pointed out that in fact, scenes that seem to be simply, again, set up as if they were a camera, um, or that is to say, have often been talked about almost as if they were snapshots rather than calculated because of the supposedly innocent eye, in fact, are loaded with meaning. Some of the observations that, Monet, that Herbert made about this painting, for example, is that there is a very strong implied um, historical undercurrent having to do with the fact that you have the elderly couple in the foreground, the younger couple in the middle ground, that the boats, for example, are both steamboats and sailboats representing older and more modern uh, methods of uh, moving across water and so forth. And Herbert's point, which I'm, at, uh, I'm really just condensing here uh, in a telegraphing form for my purposes, is that these paintings not only are calculated in their technique, not only worked on over a long period of time, and also worked at back in the studio, not only from nature, but also they frequently have strong uh, implications <coughs> of symbolical subject matter also. Um, and of course, when we look at paintings like uh, Monet's uh, picnic or luncheon on the grass, Dejeuner sur l'herbe, as uh, it is called, of 1865-66, done just a few years after Monet's uh, famous painting by the same title, we realize that to a certain degree what Monet has, uh, is doing here is responding very clearly to um, Monet's painting um, and in a certain sense sort of repositioning himself um, or I should say repositioning this scene within the history of painting by taking away from it all of the overtones of mythological subject matter, all the overtones of psychological complexity vis-a-vis -vis the viewer uh, that Monet's painting have, has, uh, has, sorry, and reinscribing the painting uh, into a, a mode which seems to be uh, concerned with the surface of everyday life. And of course, in these um, early paintings by uh, Monet, as in uh, Woman in the Garden of 1866, or the luncheon done in the mid-70s on the right-hand side, um, we are frequently dealing with a very strong uh, re remainder in the vision of uh, Monet in Monet's painting. Now, if we look at paintings like the one on the left-hand side, the uh, magpie of 1869, we also um, realize that Monet, to some degree, uh, in his landscapes, seems to be conscious also of sort of calculated effects, calculated effects that have um, a very strong, in some cases, what I would characterize in a general way almost as a kind of romantic overtone, for example, on the uh, painting on the left, the painting on the left-hand side is given an extraordinary poignancy by the fact that we've got this single living creature poised on the fence, uh, a magpie being, as you know from most of your own experience, a bird that can sit still for a very long time before it suddenly breaks and flies away. You don't have that sense of imminent movement in, in the most immediate sense that you had, let's say, in Renoir with the uh, painting of the dog, which is contemporaneous, but you do have a sense of eventual uh, movement, and of course you do have a sense of a kind of animation of the landscape through the um, uh, insertion of the living creature into it, and also I wouldn't call it an anecdotal subject matter, but there is a kind of overtone of a potential story having to do with this creature foraging in this winter landscape for food. 
Um, this is something that, for the most part, um, disappears from Monet's paintings uh, by the 1870s, kind of very obvious uh, overtone of narrative. Now, the painting on the right-hand side, Sailboat at Argenteuil, which is a, dated to around uh, 1874, is interesting for a number of reasons. Um, the first, since we're talking about subject matter, is because Monet seems here, and I say seems because he leaves it very, um, he leaves it quite ambiguous. He seems here to be contrasting the leisure activity of sailing in the foreground of the painting with the factories, with the smoke coming out of the smokestacks in the background. That is to say, he seems to be setting up a kind of um, polarity between labor and leisure. I say it seems to because unlike, let's say, Seurat in a painting like the Bagnat à Danière, which is a very obviously calculated painting in which we assume that the painter is in fact thinking out, intellectualizing, and calculating all of his effects, the style of this painting is such that we don't sense that kind of calculation. And in fact, I think it would be hard, one would be hard pressed from a kind of interpreta interpretive point of view of saying, yes, absolutely, what, one of Monet's programs here is uh, to, to point out the, a, a kind of implied class difference uh, between the leisure activity in the foreground and the uh, smokestack the labor uh, activity in the background. It's there as an overtone, but because of the style, because of the, the, the kind of myth of spontaneity, the, the sense that it's not calculated, we can't fix it as absolutely sure. The second thing I'd like to point out about the painting is the way in which he uses such extremely varied brushstroke. We like, we frequently think, now this is 1874, this is high impressionism already. Um, and we frequently think about these paintings as being, um, you know, little dabs of color one next to the other, and this is what impressionism is like. We also think of impressionist paintings as being, having a relative lack of finish. This is something that also shows up in the literature. And in a painting on the right-hand side, you'll see that Monet um, is, is not, for example, painting the sky in, um, in the same way that he paints it. Let me see. Yeah. He's not using the little dabs of paint technique all over the canvas that we get in Regatta at Argenteuil of 1874 on the left-hand side. Um, here, by the way, is an instance where uh, we can be more fairly certain that Monet is uh, meaning a very strong contrast between the uh, somewhat um, bucolic uh, leisure activity that's happening in the foreground of the painting and modernity um, racing across the back of the picture in the form of the train going over the bridge. Um, but what I find so interesting here is how, how broad a range of finish there is, even uh, in Monet's paintings that are done within a single year. And it seems that, in fact, for Monet also, there, different degrees of finish were very much part of his subject matter, I mean, sorry, part of his um, procedure. Um, now, what I also want to point out on the painting on the right-hand side is the way in which um, a certain kind of sign language changes gears, as it were, in, uh, in sort of the middle of the painting, which is a very mixed metaphor, but you'll forgive me, it's late in the day. Um, and uh, specifically in the sky. What's happening here, of course, is that a cl the, the cloud has covered the sun and the, the, the sun is about to burst out of the cloud. And it's, it's catching a momentary effect in a very dramatic way. It's described marvelously in the upper part. There's not a, a pointer here, is there? No. Okay. But I want to point out these brushstrokes right above my finger here because there, the language the, the somewhat artificial, what is already a somewhat artificial language of those broken bits uh, of brushstroke in the cloud that, in a way, enact the dynamism of what's happening, that language is translated into brushstrokes. In other words, those linear brushstrokes we actually read almost as pure brushstrokes. We don't read them as sky, we don't read them as birds, we don't read them as clouds. We see them almost as a kind of painterly commentary 
on what is happening. And this, uh, this painting, that passage in this painting, I find so interesting because we see two different ways of construing the individual brushstroke within the pictorial ensemble as a whole. Now, if we go back to the painting on the left-hand side, we can see that in the painting on the left-hand side, there are indeed passages where the brushstrokes almost, almost seem to separate themselves from what I would call their descriptive function. Um, but they are, so they are so close to descriptive function that we really don't see them as really separated from their descriptive, and then I say, you know, visually uh, uh, descriptive function. And in the painting on the left-hand side, we also find a good example, I think, of um, the way in which Monet is imposing a kind, what we might call a kind of syntax over the surface of the painting. Now, when I, when I use the word syntax here, I'm using it um, in a very particular way. Um, I'm not using it in a way that necessarily is going to lead me to a semiotic reading of the painting, but um, I'm using the word syntax uh, in, the, in the following way. The, the, the syntax, in this sense, is an interruption of our visual field that which the painting presents to us from real nature, the referent of the painting, by something in the pictorial field which acts as a kind of intermediary, as a kind of screen, as it were, between the pictorial field, I'm sorry, the visual field and the pictorial field. And we tend, we read it as occurring on the surface of the picture. And in this case, of course, it also, to some degree, modifies the degree to which we see the picture as uh, really following through with the illusion of going back into space and presenting a kind of window view um, on the world. And if you compare the Monet painting on the left-hand side with the almost uh, contemporaneous, or almost contemporary, the contemporaneous, almost contemporary um, Daubigny painting, the Daubigny is 1873, the Monet is 1874, um, you realize to how, what an important role this kind of language of the surface, this syntactical element plays. And I would say in passing, and this is something I haven't really worked out, but as I say, tonight's lecture is impressions and reflections. Um, uh, I think that it seems to me that the, uh, these kinds of syntactical devices almost always are repetitive. That is to say, they almost see, always seem to imply some sort of a screen or underlying implied grid uh, in relation to the uh, total image. Here is a somewhat different, inaccurate in a different way slide of the painting that we just saw. And I compare it with an 1872 um, painting, that is a circa 1872 painting. Again, these are roughly contemporaneous. Um, uh, to show you again the range of effect in these paintings, the, the range of finish in these paintings. The painting on the right-hand side looks much more like it might have actually been painted in a single sitting. It has a kind of rawness and openness, uh, especially in the, in the brushwork, in the uh, water. Um, and here's a, a not-so-hot slide, again, of the painting we were just looking at. But um, it does, in fact, impose a greater sense of this surface or syntactical pattern than did the painting, this painting. And if we take a painting like the marvelous uh, Bridget Argenteuil from the um, Musée d'Orsay on the right-hand side, and we compare it with a painting like this one or a painting like this one, and then we go up and look at a detail of it, we realize that in Monet's work, despite the mythology, there seems to be a kind of hierarchy of finish. There are paintings that he leaves, that he signs, that he sees as finished, that are really quite sketchy, but there are also paintings that he works up quite a bit, and as you can see, works on, it would seem, over a long period of time, and works on with a much finer um, network of brush strokes. Let me see if I got the slide in the right place. Right. And as you can see, even when uh, working from a fairly uh, similar motif. There are different degrees in finish. Even in these slides, I can think you can see the much um, more honed in, refined sense of finish in the uh, painting on the right-hand side. 
Now, something else that I think um, is interesting in these Argenteuil paintings is um, basically what has been left out. The fact that um, Monet shows you this, this area here almost as if the only real intrusion of modernity is the bridge, the uh, road bridge that's running across the river, whereas in fact, right on the other side of that bridge, there was, actually there was a railroad bridge not far away, and there was also um, a, uh, a network of port and factory facilities. In other words, there was an industri what we would call a small industrial complex there also. That he turned his back on. In, I, from, I, so far as I can think, all of the, or virtually all of the Argenteuil paintings, where he does address the question, oops, keep going. No, I'm sorry. Here he is looking uh, upriver, and again, uh, as when you first look at the painting, there it seems to be really quite, shall we say, relatively bucolic. Um, but you notice there are stacks in the background, and right, okay, and where he where he does in fact uh, paint. Um, this actually rather grim industrial reality is not at uh, Argenteuil, even though some version of it existed there, but uh, closer to Paris at um, uh, clichy Anier, actually just outside of Paris where he painted this extraordinary and uh, rather unusual painting called Loading Coal, in which under a very similar bridge to the bridge at Argenteuil, um, so similar that it could almost be mistaken for it, uh, we see these uh, very sort of automaton-like, uh, not at all detailed laborers um, uh, carrying coal uh, off the barge. Now, something else that is a very common subject in Impressionist painting, both for Monet and for Renoir, is um, what I would call the image of the woman inscribed in nature. And uh, my feeling is that this image of the woman inscribed in nature, although I would not say that it is a calculatedly symbolical motif, that is to say, a motif that, that Monet and Renoir um, saw in a didactic way um, as having a specific symbolical significance, is so common that it seems to become one of the conventions, and I think finally a, what I would call, if not calculated, a premeditated convention of Impressionist painting. You see it in uh, Gladioli of 1873, of which I show you the full painting on the left, in which the woman, of course, is set against the flower forms on the right-hand side of the painting, almost as if she were another flower. And you notice that the parasol that she's carrying is almost like the, the petals of the flower form that she articulates. I'm speaking metaphorically here, of course. Um, a painting, by the way, that is, uh, also gives you a nice, I haven't had reasonable detailed slides uh, of it. It gives you a nice sense of, of the, how the surfaces work, how he is, in fact, working uh, uh, wet over dry, sometimes uh, with, a, with actually a very, very uh, dry paint, too, with very little medium in it. Um, and you get these kind of flying white effects as you get uh, here. The other thing is, um, it's like the equivalent of you know the, 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 the reverse of the flying white that you get in uh, oriental brush painting. But the other thing is that this is on a slightly toned canvas. And this, often we say that you know Monet always worked on a white canvas. In fact, there is uh, a bit more toning of the canvas uh, than one expects in his paintings. Now, here again, We've got, I, I just want to focus for a couple of minutes on, again, what we can call the inscription of the figures, and they're usually women and children inscribed in the landscape as being part of nature, as uh, the, the image of the woman, flower-like, plant-like, um, fertile, um, procreative, the image of the child uh, in a certain sense, sharing in this implication of the overtone of nature. Um, a sense uh, sometimes, and again, I'm speaking metaphorically in paintings like the one on the right-hand side of the actual woman's work uh, being articulated in a, a metaphorical way by the, the kind of tapestry of flowers behind her, which reminds one of woven imagery. Again, 
uh, and there's actually quite a broad range of this inscription of the woman in nature. Now, of course, at first you could say, well, after all, there must have been a lot of women walking around in the landscapes. There must have been a lot of kids walking around in the landscapes. Of course, as you begin to look at these paintings, you realize how calculated, how posed they are. And once again, if we move back from that image that we carry around residually so much of the time in our minds, that these are sort of snapshots rather than paintings, we realize, of course, these are all posed and calculated. Um, you know, Monet has dragged his paint box and set it up there and actually, you know, in a canvas, and he's, he's got these people to pose for him. Um, but something else that you might ask, is there another way of doing it? Um, and there is another way of doing it. And that other way of doing it is perhaps best done in a comparison not with Monet, but rather with Renoir. Um, on the uh, left-hand side, I'm showing you the Renoir on the terrace. And this is a wonderful uh, example of, uh, from the Boston Museum of Fine Arts of 1881. It's a wonderful example of an inscription of a woman in nature where uh, behind, she is wearing a flat, uh, uh, sorry, a hat with flowers on it. She has flowers in her bosom. She has a basket of flowers in front of her. The child uh, next to her is, you'll notice, sharing her general profile, is encompassed by the form of her body. Also, the little girl is wearing a hat with flowers. And then there is a gate, uh, or I'm sorry, a, bal uh, a grillwork, you know, balcony behind her. But look what Renoir has done. He's interwoven these, these, these um, climbing plant forms around it, once again, to naturalize the man-made. Now, are there other possibilities? Well, of course there are other possibilities. And those other are possibilities are the possibilities that we see, for example, in Monet, most, and uh, most especially in paintings like the Railway um, or Gaston Lazare um, on the uh, right-hand side. And um, what, of course, is so interesting about this is 1872-73, is that in a certain sense what Monet is doing here is deconstructing all of those elements of woman nature, um, the implied mother-child. Not only don't you really know uh, when you look at this painting for a while whether this woman is uh, even even knows who this child is, frankly. Uh, I mean, the more you look at this painting, the more mysterious the relationship between these two people become, the more mysterious this whole painting is. There's this wonderful passage down on the right-hand side uh, of those grapes, uh, and one wonders who brought those grapes there, why are those grapes there, perhaps is it, is, is it some sort of uh, arcane reference that Manet is making to the uh, well-known story of Zeuxis and the, uh, you know, the, 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 the grapes that are so realistic who painted the birds came down to uh, eat them, and, and this perhaps is an antithesis of that. I mean, it's a painting that has lots of narrative lines, none of which really in, in the, add up to make a single narrative. But what I want to emphasize here is the way in which Manet kind of deconstructs the soft, uh, flower-like, protective woman and instead what you have is this very harsh, and look at the way in which the grill work is handled, very harsh uh, background. Um, there are no plant forms to soften it, um, and you're not even sure whether these two women are really you know, sharing more than just physically the same space. Now, this gets us to the, uh, another question, and that question, aside from stylistic um, ticks, there was an enormous range of style and meaning in so-called impressionist paintings. This goes beyond the political divisions of the group and, I mean, and goes beyond not only the, 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 the political in the sense of social political divisions, but also the art political divisions of the group. Manet, for example, who refused to show with the impressionists, um, although especially from 1874 on, he had a certain close relationship with Monet and uh, to some degree with Renoir. Um, who actually did quite a bit lesser degree with Renoir. Um, Degas, who showed very loyally with the group in their eight exhibitions, but who uh, was very much against uh, plein air or outdoor painting. Uh, Degas is supposed to have said that he, uh, he thought that the, uh, you know, the, these people should be shot with buckshot to keep them from uh, littering the landscape uh, with uh, oily paint rags in a, in a, in a, in a curmudgeonly, uh, you know, taking a, that curmudgeonly position. But in other words, they all had such very different 
attitudes, I wonder really whether to any degree the, the word impressionist, although it has of course a real historical resonance because it was used at the time, although parenthetically, to my knowledge, none of the so-called eight impressionist exhibitions was called an impressionist exhibition. They would call the painting the, indep the independent painters. Um, but I think that maybe one of the myths is that there is such a thing as a group called the impressionists who shared in uh, common values of when it's seen amongst themselves. Now I will grant that when you see men like this in relation, or men and women like this, because you've also got Bert Marizo, Eva Gonzalez in this group, when you see um, the impressionist, so-called impressionist artists in relation to their contemporaries, then you see how different they were from the uh, more flat-footed sort of realism of many of their contemporaries. But I, I want, I'll, I'll get to, actually I'm going to get to that in just a minute, so let me hop ahead. This is a bit of a crazy quilt um, uh, presentation um, to the uh, painting on the left-hand side by uh, Monet of Alex uh, Chaden in the uh, Garden of 1881. And once again, it's the woman inscribed within nature, and, and look even the way in which she literally echoes the movement of the tree. Now, on the right-hand side, is a very interesting early um, Renoir nude of 1869. And here, of course, we understand the, the language. We understand the symbolical language. When we see a nude in a landscape like this, we are prepared to make that jump, partly, of course, because the nude is not seen as part of imagery of everyday life. And we're, we're able, uh, in a situation like this, to say, oh, yes, this woman is surrounded by uh, aspects of nature that can be seen are as her attributes. And what I'm saying is that the Impressionists are actually doing a very similar thing uh, in uh, their paintings of women in landscapes. And I think you can see to what degree this is true if you compare the uh, painting on the left-hand side, Monet's Woman Under the Willows of 1880 with Bastien Lepage's uh, saint Jean, which you all know from the Metropolitan Museum, which is 1879, one year uh, earlier, and what very different uh, ideas of the inscription of the woman in the landscape in terms of narrative content, but since this is a painting that you all know, you can see beyond this rather mediocre slide, and you remember what a decollage, what a separation there is stylistically in this painting between the landscape and the woman. The woman looks as if she's almost been glued down onto the landscape stylistically. And uh, in other words, what I'm making uh, a case for here is also the way in which the formal consistency, the treat, the, the, the cliche about treating figures in landscape in the same kind of way produces a new kind of meaning. And of course, if you don't mind my kicking a dead horse, so to speak, um, the fact that the Impressionist painters did have a sense of uh, humor, symbolism, uh, a sense of the anecdotal when they wanted to, uh, uh, and how they made use of it can be very interestingly seen in these two paintings by, uh, respectively, Renoir and Monet of 1874, of Madame Monet in the garden, uh, in uh, the uh, Monet painting, uh, Monet himself is seen in the, gar in the background, but you'll notice, of course, that in the painting on the left-hand side, Renoir replaces Monet with the rooster, and the rooster, in, se in a sense, becomes the father of the family, uh, as in relation to the uh, two other fall behind him. I mean, so, you know, to think that these painters were just going out there and painting what they saw without any sense, in, in a kind of almost witless, pedestrian way, is obviously um, not so. Now, something that I find extremely interesting to get back to this notion of language is uh, it came a year or two ago and I was looking at uh, the painting on the left-hand side, actually, but it's true of both of these paintings. This is the Rue Monnier uh, decked with flags of 1878. Um, no, Rue Monnier, I'm sorry, the Rue Montreuil decked with flags of June 30th, the national holiday at that time, 1878. And what is so interesting here is that if you look at this painting carefully, and it's true of the painting on the right-hand side to a large degree also, what Monet has done very cleverly is that he is he's using the French tricolor with the uh, red, white, and blue bars. And what he's done is he's given us some instances 
quite obviously, where the red, white, and blue read. And we can see them as being a French flag. And then, as you go back into the painting, there are lots and lots of red, white, and blue marks that, have no, that don't take on the form of the French flag at all. But because he has set up the model for us in the foreground, we then read our eye, our mind, then, in a sense, creates the language. And we then read all those red, white, and blue flags as flags. Even though, as you can see, if you look back in through here, frequently all you've got is a little red dab or a little white or blue dab. And the same thing is true in the uh, painting on the right-hand side. Very different in, uh, in effect, let's say, from Monet, Monet's uh, two versions of the Rue Meunier, painted the same, of the same day, in a sense. These are both celebrating the same day. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say, yes, the one on the left-hand side, not the one on the right. Um, um, and now in, in Monet, we can see there is a much more obvious kind of symbolical or allegorical, if you will, almost reading, in that, of course, this is the national holiday, and what you see is a man with one leg, presumably a war veteran, wearing workman's blues, contrasted to the well-heeled people over on the right-hand side, contrasted also with the vacant lot on the left-hand side, which I, I don't want to get into that whole tedious business of houseman ruining Paris, but if nothing else, what you've got here is transition um, and a certain kind of de destruction of pa something from the past, uh, ruination of the past, which this man is connected to, and of course also the fact that it is a holiday, that there are people who can uh, take their leisure uh, for this holiday, but in the foreground here there is a man carrying a ladder who presumably is going to work uh, on the construction site. I mean, here there is a much stronger kind of social commentary uh, involved, uh, as there is in the painting uh, on the right-hand side, than in any of the Monet paintings, um, so that there are really quite... Um, there's quite a wide variety of degrees to which this is um, articulated. We're running kind of long on, short on time, aren't we? Um, okay, I, I would like to um, make a couple of comments about the Gar San Lazar series because um, I think that, let me show you first, uh, I'll go for about 10 more minutes, I know, because we're really way over for what the hour would have been. If you have somewhere to get to, please don't feel badly about going. Um, what I want to talk about is, first of all, in the Gaius and Lazar series, once again, there is a fairly wide uh, variety of handling of the paint, from the very sketchy um, uh, rendering and paintings, like the one on the right, left-hand side, to uh, a more um, stiffly drawn uh, rendering, as in the uh, end of the train elements, especially on the, on the right, a very heavily worked and at the same time, extremely atmospheric version, as in this word uh, on the left-hand side. And um, once again, generally speaking, when you see the Garcin Lazar paintings uh, reproduced, you see the ones that have a kind of Greek temple pediment. These become the image of the Garcin Lazar, whereas, of course, Monet did a number of paintings of the Garcin Lazar seen from other places, from down on the tracks, from uh, outside the tunnel, from under the Pont de l'Europe, and these paintings, again, only in recent years have begun to be reproduced with any frequency. Um, in a certain sense, the art history books have, have selected um, these paintings uh, for Monet. And something else that I'd like to um, point out, and maybe these two slides would be most appropriate, is that um, at the time that Monet painted these paintings, I'd like to read you a very brief description, because I think that this is something that, and uh, again, uh, Monet was very, very much interested in, and that was, let me, let me start that sentence all over again. Something that I think Monet was very much interested in was being able to um, create a situation in which he could evoke the sublime, the awe-inspiring, within a human, rather than, uh, within a humanly made, uh, landscape or cityscape rather than within um, uh, natural landscape. And I, th I think this is something that began to occupy him in a serious way in 
1877, when he was working on the Garcin Lazar series, and uh, in a few minutes, right before I close, I want to show you uh, some of the late London pictures in which I think he really uh, brings this idea to a kind of culmination. And this is something that was seen at the time by uh, Riviere, if I can find the text. If I can't find the text, we may just skip it. Give me just a second. Yes. Uh, in his uh, essay in L'Impressioniste of April 1877, when these paintings were first shown, um, he says, um, In one of, these, one of the largest pictures, the train has just arrived and the engine is about to set off again. Now listen to the, the language that Riviere uses. Like a fiery, straining animal, excited rather than wearied by its long haul, it shakes a mane of smoke which rises to meet the glass roof of the great station. Men team around the monster on the track like pygmies at the feet of the giant, to make, giving a kind of scope and breadth and grandeur to the scene as he makes this kind of uh, word picture. Beyond it, sleeping engines stand in readiness. We can hear the shouting railway men, the engine's piercing whistle spreading their cry of alarm, the endless clanking of metal, and the awesome hiss of steam. And then he says at the end of this section about Monet, looking at this magnificent picture, we are seized with the same emotion as we feel before nature. And this emotion is perhaps stronger still because the picture contains the emotion of the artist as well. And I, I, I think what um, Riviere picks up on here is that sense of Monet trying to um, evoke the sublime as he can be evoked in nature uh, in the urban landscape. I'm going to skip uh, these and these because I want to make, I want to get, it is late and I want to get to the main points that I want to get to. And so, um, and I'm, I'm going to sort of talk about the sublime and, um, and what, and naturalism. Because what is so interesting, of course, is that when you look at the paintings, for example, that um, Monet uh, did when he was on the Normandy coast in the 1880s, one of the things that I, I find so interesting is in these two 1882 paintings is how different the positioning of man in relation to nature is by the way in which he divides the canvas. That is to say, if I hadn't shown you, and I, I actually meant not to show you, if I hadn't shown you at first, the painting on the right-hand side, you see this as, uh, we see this on a, on a calm day. Um, we are up on the cliff. We are protected from nature. We see the, the, the uh, fences running along the cliff. There's the comfortable hotel-like, you know, looking hotel-like building. In other words, we see this as, as separated from the, from the, from the, um, the chaotic, unpredictable qualities of nature. Whereas in a painting like the Custom House on the right-hand side, Monet has now set the um, land very low in relation to the rest of the picture and made the house look extremely vulnerable. And if you know this series of paintings, you're aware of the fact that this is, he, he creates very strong psychological effects simply by where he places the same kind of motif on the picture. Um, one of the most striking examples of Monet dealing with the sublime in nature is in 1886 when he goes to Belle Isle, the island off the, uh, the Brittany coast, and paint, painting like this one, The Storm at Belle Isle, um, I show you on the right-hand side a slide that I hope you'll forgive me for. It's the only slide I could, I could get in time for tonight, which, of course, is taken from a book. Uh, and you also see the stitching of the book running down it. But if you can you try to see past that, um, I show you now a rocks at Belle Isle. And, of course, as you look at this, you have the sense that you are on the end of the earth. You, it, you are looking out. I mean, you feel that, you know, you look out there and... There are, th there are thousands of miles before you're going to see any land. And by the way, it's more or less true when you're there. But you, you would sense also that Monet is painting this place at a place like, if any of you are aware of, of Michael Skellig or any of the little Irish monastery islands, these little rocks uh, you know, off the Irish coast, the sense of absolute isolation. Um, and I think it could be instructive to see what the motif actually looks like. And here are some photographs 
Now, unfortunately, when I was there with the camera, I, the tide was not high for me. But as you can see, the positioning was fairly decent. And you can see that Monet was pretty accurate in the way he set this. Of course, I didn't have a reproduction with me, so I was doing it from memory. Um, and also, uh, as has been pointed out, uh, Monet may actually have used postcards of Belle-Ile to have helped him in these compositions also. But my main point is, of even this photograph, you, you notice that you don't have the sense in this photograph that you're on the edge of the Earth. You get a sense of the fact that you really are very much on land. And not only on you're on land, but of course, he left out, he leaves out what you see on the right-hand side here. He leaves out, this is actually a little closer to what it actually looks like as you stand there. And so that what basically Monet has done is he has taken this view, which is what he saw, and he has transformed it into this marvelous image of elemental forces of nature at, the, at land's end. It is, to some degree, a fiction, a visual fiction. And like all great fictions, an effective visual fiction that has, of course, a powerful truth within it. Um, okay, I, okay, very briefly, um, I think that something that has often been underestimated in the series paintings also, which have been talked about ad nauseum in terms of that he wanted to get the different times of day, the different seasons, the different <laughs> moments. But in fact, when you look at these paintings, and if any of you had the good fortune to see the uh, Monet series painting show when it was at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts a few years ago, you realize that there are, these paintings are uh, almost hallucinatory in uh, the view that they give us of nature. Very different, for example, for example, from paintings like these two paintings by Fissaro, painted around the same time. These are uh, two, the painting on the um, right is 1891, the painting on the left is 1894, that is around the same time as the series paintings. And I'm just, I, I, the comparison that I'm making is simply in terms of a certain literalness as opposed to a picture in which the, 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 the poetry and this reaching for the sublime is so uh, clearly apparent. The, Mo the Rouen Cathedral paintings we now know uh, were not only not all painted at Rouen, but in fact were worked on extensively uh, back at Monet's uh, studio at uh, Giverny. And uh, now, by the way, what is this to say? Is this to say that Monet is a liar, that Monet cheated? I, I don't want to give that impression at all. The, the, what I am saying is, of course, that Monet was, these are calculated effects. He did, in fact, set himself up with canvases that he worked on at specific times of day. And then he brought them back to his studio, and he brought them together. He made them into works of art rather than just spontaneous reactions to the most super, superficial action, uh, aspects of his vision. Let me just flip by these because they're just so, they're so marvelous just to look at. And also how unliteral, how, how far he pushes the exaggeration. Which leads me to the last group of pictures that I want to show you. And those are the paintings that he did in London in 1903 and 1904. The Waterloo Bridge paintings, of which I show you two 1903 versions. And now here there's a, a very interesting, I think, and very, um, actually I find puzzling and very challenging uh, subject. Because here, of course, the smokestacks and the smoke and the smog and the grime are very much part of the painting. This is something he's obviously setting out to capture this. And in doing so, uh, and you can even get some sense of the painting on the left-hand side. Some of these paintings actually look grimy. The color, you can almost feel the grime uh, you know, in the air. Um, and if you ask the question, are these pessimistic or optimistic views of the city of London, I think that you really can't, that's not the question. I don't think that these, that is the question that these paintings address. And this is within uh, the practice of a certain kind of um, <coughs> rather literal um, somewhat unmediated reinscription of painting simply into a, a social milieu, this becomes one of the questions. Did Monet think that London was a terrible, awful, grimy place, or did he think it was beautiful? Um, 
And, or, and usually, by the way, the answer is that he thought it was a terrible, grimy place, and he's showing us the evils of industrial capitalism and the rest of it. But in fact, I think that he's doing neither of those two things. I think that what he really is doing is giving us sublime vision of this almost hallucinatory, new and exciting lands kind of landscape. We see it in the um, uh, Waterloo Bridge paintings, and we see it perhaps even more strongly in the Houses of Parliament paintings. And in the Houses of Parliament paintings, which I'll show you just about a handful. And by the way, the brushstrokes, I just saw this painting uh, in, Mo in Paris. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I, had always, I, I was beginning to wonder, since I'd been looking at the slide for so long, whether in fact that streaky quality wasn't just in the slide, but it's not. I mean, it, the, it is in fact brushed that way. An astonishing uh, freedom and breath, an astonishing dematerialization of matter, where energy, as it were, light, water, air, kind of corrode and eat away what is supposed to be solid and real. And of course there is. Within Monet, Monet's lexicon of painter heroes, a precedent for that, and another painter of the sublime, Turner. And of course, the, the biggest difference here is that Turner, for example, in the burning of the Houses of Parliament, uh, painted some 70 years earlier in 1835, um, gets, brings a, about this effect of dematerialization by showing us an event, a conflagration, as he so often does, some sort of an, uh, a kind of uh, meteorological event, a storm, a, uh, you know, a, a snowstorm, um, rain, uh, fire, whereas Monet finds that kind of uh, energy, that kind of um, dematerialization, and finally that kind of vision of the sublime right in what he sees uh, Un, not burning, not swept away by storm. Uh, it's the, the storm and the fire, as it were, built right into the painting itself. Thank you.